Welcome to the award-winning Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashner, covering metaphysics, ETs, shamanism, and channeling. Here you will find spiritual inspiration from today's thought leaders, along with cutting-edge insights from our interstellar brothers and sisters and ancient shamanic wisdom. Now, here's a new episode of Dare to Dream with your host, Debbie Dashinger. Hi, and welcome. It is so great to have you guys here, Debbie Dashinger, and today I am speaking with Phil Gruber about unlocking the mysteries on advanced healing, sacred geometry, light language, and dimensional ascension. This show has won several awards, three Talk Radio Change Positive Awards, COVR Award for Best Podcast, Welp Magazine named it one of the best 20 podcasts to listen to this year, and also high ranking under self-improvement on Apple Podcasts. I want to thank Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness for doing the beautiful energy work they do out in the world. They sponsor this show. You can find out more at Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R dot com. And I want to thank Terry, for one of our listeners, for sending me this amazing and fun necklace that spells out dream. It is super cool. And I just thank you guys so much. I've gotten fairy orbs and all sorts of wonderful love and gifts from you guys. And overall, I'm so grateful you are on this journey and that you are my tribe. In Quechua and Peru, we would call you my Ayu, and I am your Ayu, our tribe, our community together. Well, I've got something very special for you. I put together a star seed report as well as a video which breaks down 19 different galactic star seeds. So, so many people want to know what's my galactic heritage. You can find out. And once you do, you'll know what your weaknesses are, your strengths, where you came from, what you went through, what you probably look like physically, what your mission and purpose are. This is a really fun gift. You want to go to debbie-dashinger.com slash starseed. D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash starseed. Also coming up, I am opening up the Animal Spirit Medicine Program. It is a shamanic healing program. And every week, the attendees who come get one hour of healing and working with animal wisdom. I am so excited. I was just interviewed on radio this morning about this and about the various animals. So you can also begin a very profound journey in this sacred mystical realm of unique animal beings who have chosen to share their wisdom with you. Join the class. I'd love to work with you. It's at debbie-dashinger.com slash shaman. DebbieDashinger.com slash shaman. Well, my guest today is Phil Gruber, featured in the critically acclaimed film, The Indigo Evolution. His passion, wit, and intelligence has made him a much-loved and in-demand speaker internationally. Phil is acknowledged worldwide as one of the foremost teachers of advanced healing systems, light language, sacred geometry, the Magdalene Mysteries, the Indigos, the structure of consciousness, space-time, ET contact, and so much more. He has spoken at the United Nations and is a co-author, along with James Twyman, of the best-selling book, The Kabbalah Code. His CD, The Song of Indra, has earned iconic status in the genre of New Age music. And it is such a pleasure because Phil and I are going to be speaking together next month. So I warmly welcome to the program, Phil Gruber. It is so great to have you on Dare to Dream. It's great to be here, Debbie. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Even at 5 a.m. in the morning, well, 5.19. I want to it's, start it's, there, 5.19. What are you doing living in Singapore? What is a Jersey, New York boy doing living <laughs> in Singapore? Well, it's an old story. I came here in 2002 to teach teach an advanced healing system known as Cathara healing, bio-spiritual healing. And I met a girl. You, you met know, a girl. I met a girl. We didn't start dating for, for years later, but um, I knew there was something. It was something at first sight, you know? I think it was love at first sight. And uh, we didn't start dating for years. Um, 
after we first met. We eventually got married in New York in 2008 on the Upper West Side of New York. And um, we, uh, we, ended up, we, we started our married life in Australia because we actually wanted to, to live in New Zealand. Mm. But we had to put in a couple of years in Australia, establish residency. But um, I didn't, we really didn't like Australia. So we came back to Singapore where her family is. She's Singaporean. She's Indian. She's Singaporean. And her work and her family was here. And I, we've been here now. We just celebrated our 16th anniversary. Oh. Um, and so I've been here 16 years. Tough, toughest part about being here is the weather. I was born in October. I'm, I'm from the Northeast. My family's from the Austrian Alps. I mean, we like it nippy, you know? I mean, you know, my ancestry is in Austria. Me too. Yeah, there you Look go. My name. My, real name, my real name is Von Gruber, you know? Really? So, and so I like it a little on the chilly side. Not cold, mind you, but in here in Singapore, it's just relentlessly hot and humid mm. all day, every day. We're, right, we're three inches from the equator. I live in a rainforest. Wow. You know, so that's the big challenge here is the weather. Other, other than that, it's a very cool, especially if you like this part of the world. We're so close to Bali, Thailand, mm. Southeast Asia. If you like this part of the world, it's it's really heavenly to be here. Oh, it sounds just beautiful. Wow. Interesting story. I got to call you Phil Von Gruber now because that's a name. That's like a count or something. It is a name. Well, I'd be the Baron of Tyrol right now, but that, like <laughs> say, that in 65 cents will get you a cup of coffee. I don't even know if 65 cents will get you a cup of coffee. <laughs> anymore. No, <laughs> more like 650. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Well, Phil, I can't wait to meet you next month. We are going to meet in Glastonbury, UK. We are both speaking at the Portal to Ascension event in September. And I just wanted to ask you, what are you most looking forward to? Either about being there, what you're going to do, what you're going to see, the event. Yeah, I mean, I've tried. Like a lot of us, we've traveled a lot. And there are very few places in the world as we discussed before, that I really feel at home. Mm -hmm. And there's something about Glastonbury. Well, in the Abbey, on the grounds of Glastonbury Abbey, I feel a sense of peacefulness. I'll be bringing my harp with me. Well, my auto harp, my zither. And when I'm in the Abbey and I'm and I'm playing my oh, little... Oh, the acoustics. Oh, my little pentatonically tuned, uh, open tuned auto harp. It's just... It's like the love that knows no earthly bounds. Oh. It's just, I feel so much at peace. I feel that's that's the zone. Also teaching. Uh, my One of my big lessons in life, you probably heard this before. I have the joy that I find teaching. If I can find that when I'm not teaching, it doesn't matter. Like here it is 530 in the morning. But when we start, man, I'm right there. It doesn't matter how jet lagged or whatever I am. Wow. When I start teaching, this is, this is, I know this is where I'm meant to be. You're on. That's they beautiful. Change. We yeah. better be able to see each other. And I'm, I'm thinking, I actually, you know what? We can, because I've seen the agenda. And unlike many events where they juxtaposition two to five different rooms yeah. and speakers, we are going linear. So we will yeah. be free to wander about the castle or to go see each other. Yep. And this I can't is what wait I really to love about the, the Neil and the how he's organized the Portal to Ascension conferences. Yes, there's no having to choose. That's so tough. And a lot of these other conferences, you've got two, three, four things going at the same time. No, it's very linear. Everybody gets to see everybody. Yeah. And that's really beautiful. It is you beautiful. Know? The attendees, the speakers as well can enjoy each other. And I love that. And since we're going to be in Glastonbury, sacred home of King Arthur and Mary yeah. Magdalene. Aww. So let's mention the Magdalene mysteries. There's a story of Mary Magdalene. And I love the stories that we in our tribe know of and speak of. And it really holds profound esoteric significance. Can you unveil some of them since this is some of your many expertise, Phil? What are some of the hidden truths and the mysteries surrounding Mary Magdalene's life and her teachings? 
Wow, that's a big subject, but it's one of my favorite things in the world to talk about. Right. But well, I want to start, actually, if it's okay with you, talking about star seeds, okay. talking about and then sort of braiding it in and, okay. and, and letting it sort of braid together and dovetail with the mysteries of the Magdalene, because I think we're all children yes. of the Magdalene. Mm. You know? And there is a reason that Mary Magdalene and all the Marys, this what we call the circles of Marys, were chosen for these special roles. You know, I'm very much into the Pistis Sophia. Uh, Pistis Sophia is one of the Gnostic Gospels that didn't make it into the biblical canon because it was so controversial. Pistis Sophia takes place after the resurrection. Jesus or Yeshua, Jeshua, returns for an additional 14 years after the resurrection, to teach the higher mysteries. And what it is, it's really an extended conversation between him and Mary Magdalene. I mean, all the disciples are there. They ask their questions, but they don't understand the answers. It's see, and Mary really has to sort of, uh, uh, what's the word, um, moderate and really interpret the answers because it, it seems that Mary, the women were the ones that understood it. The men were clueless. Hate to say it. And I still have the, the opinion that Jesus chose his disciples. He wanted the women, but the women came with the men. The women seemed to be the only ones that really understood the deeper mysteries, the mysteries of ascension, all this kind of stuff. And the reason I think they were chosen to be these sacred priestesses was because of their genetics, their gene code. Mary Magdalene came from an area we know as uh, Bethlehem, these areas of Galilee, Bethlehem. There were a lot of the tribe that there were clusters of was, was the Benjamins, the Benjaminite, the Benjamin tribe, and all the others. If you go into the history of the, the, the tribes, the original tri tribes, they consider the Benjaminites the abominations. Why? Because the Benjaminites, especially, well, the women and the men also, but the Benjamins were the result, the product of the hybridization of the Nephilim, Anunnaki, the Nephilim with human females. And they created a race called the Raelim, which became the Benjamin tribes. And the reason they were chosen to be these sacred priestesses, these vestal virgins, these sacred vessels, these pathfinders, these way showers, was because they had special genetics, because they were the product of human females, earth females, who many times didn't survive. They were basically raped. These were big guys. May I they ask you, when guys. you say Nephilim, yeah. aren't Nephilim also considered to be associated with the Elohim, the co-creator gods? Yeah, but there's many, yeah, that, that's, I'm glad you brought that up, but there are many, many iterations of the Elohim. There are higher Elohistic councils, lower Elohistic councils. To really understand this on a much deeper level, we really have to understand basic cosmic structure, dimensional structure, genealogies. I mean, our history, I'm really glad you, you know, it's funny, you are definitely psychic because you're bringing up the stuff that I would want to talk about next. But just to finish the Mary Magdalene thing, the reason the Magdalene's and the Marys were so special was because of their genetics, because of their advanced genetics, because they were the product of angels and women, that they could create very special exotic chemistries, substances, secretions in their body, that if you know how to use them, you could give someone a taste of the Christos. That's why in the Holy of Holies, or let's face it, the Holy of Holies, the Holy of Holies, may, even nowadays men, there's, there's this something in our consciousness that we're drawn to want to go to these temples of divine science. Temples of divine spirituality. Well, now they're called brothels. You see how it's been corrupted. You know, even the word whore used to mean divine child. The oldest root of the word whore. Prostitute used to mean, and the oldest root is a woman who is sovereign unto herself. Oh, my goodness. This is huge. Who is not under the thumb of a man. See? 
Yeah, it should not be glossed over. That's so huge. And back in Mary's time when she came of age, she was in the Isis temple and did something called sacred sexuality. There was That's nothing right. morally wrong with it. In fact, it was considered to be a goddess who was able to do go through the teaching and then do this job. It was so sacred that it was done in the temple. It was done. It was considered so sacred, and they were trained since since they were little girls. They were under the stewardship of what they call a priest, like a, what do they call it when you're um when somebody goes along with you on a date in the old country? Oh, like a chaperone. Chaperone. Yeah. Well, when they say that Mary Magdalene was released from, released from seven demons, she was not possessed. This was not an exorcism. They were under the the they were celibates until the time they were ready to get married. But they were under the stewardship and the custodialship of what's called the seven demon priests. And when they were released from the custodianship of the seventh demon priest, then they were ready to get married. So it wasn't that she was released from seven demons. She was released from this, from being chaperoned around when she was ready to get married. And they trained for these positions of being these, they were the revealing vehicles for the, for the grace of God. You know, Jesus, when he talked about, when he would talk about Mary Magdalene or the Marys, he would talk about that, that they had the effulgence of light they 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 healed by their presence alone. You know, like the Emoto crystals, I love talking about them because the most beautiful of the Emoto crystals are the ones where you project thoughts of forgiveness and gratitude. And the reason they can hold and radiate so much light is because of their geometrical structure. We get into a little bit of the light language and sacred geometry. The reason they can hold and radiate that light is because of their structure. So imagine if you become the living embodiment of these of these spiritual attitudes, the, the true attitudes of, of mastery. If you really become the living embodiment of forgiveness and grace and gratitude, every crystal and micro crystal in your body will be able to hold and radiate that light. That's when you walk the earth and you become a healer by your presence alone. You illuminate all the darkest spaces. You don't have to have a mastership or a certain Reiki or electromagnetic healing. You heal by your presence alone. And that's one of the things I think we're, we're reaching for is to heal by our very presence, to have that effulgence of light to be just healers by just by our sheer presence. Any moto, um, I think that was a, a really big step in understanding the power of our thoughts, not just that thoughts um, have an influence on the growth and shape of crystals, but there's an architecture to our thoughts. And the more we start thinking in divine thoughts, the more we'll see that projected in our hologram in the outside world. Very beautiful. We have to start being, like they say, the best versions of ourselves. And there is an attitude and etiquette mm -hmm. involved in really being mastering this experience here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're talking about the scientist Emoto who did the work on the, the water and the plants and mm -hmm. saw negative thoughts and what happened and positive thoughts. And he broke it down. You could see through a microscope what happened with that energy. So the call for us to take on um, a very positive, loving, best us being, uh, I agree with wholeheartedly. It all starts with us. And so back to Mary Magdalene, yeah. what mm -hmm. other truths have been, are you aware of, have been hidden from us or mysteries? Maybe you don't even know the answer to. Well, I, I think I got some pretty good pieces. Of course, I'm not the, the book doesn't stop with me and I'm not, uh, well, it's interesting. You know, you think everybody thinks the pot of gold is the other end of the rainbow. I wonder what the people at the other end of the rainbow were thinking. They think it's where you are. You know, it's it's an amazing thing. But the original, we go back, Mary, all these great mysteries, they're all tied up to understand more about Mary Magdalene and the mysteries of the Magdalene, the mysteries of the Christos. When, the more you know about the indigos, the more you know about ascension, the more you know about the original human design, it all dovetails. The fact is that the original human design itself is of extraterrestrial origin. 
in that the angelic or yeah. angelic nature, humans originally inhabited what we call, in my paradigm, the second density dimensions four, five, and six. We live in a what I term a 15-dimensional time matrix where, where consciousness is structured 15 dimensions, but broken up into five universes, five three-dimensional universes. More about that later, maybe. But just you know, to cut to the chase, I think it's important. We want aren't these the most pertinent questions, Debbie? We ask ourselves, where do we come from? Who are we? Yes. Why are we here? Absolutely. What's our purpose here? Well, the more we know about dimensional structure, the more we know about the physics and metaphysics of consciousness and creation, the connection with the indigos, the connection with the Magdalene, our DNA, the art and science of ascension, that humans originally inhabited what's called the second density, that's dimensions four, five, and six, time fields of Earth, where Earth is called Tara. There's a fifth dimensional version of Earth that we call Tara. There's also an eighth dimensional version of Earth that we call Gaia. And well, people will ask, well, what's a dimension? Dimension is a frequency band. It's a band with the frequency. Well, what's frequency? Frequency is a number of oscillations in a given unit of time, of very small ultra micro particles. In other words, all these different dimensions are different frequencies, different rates of vibration, different rates of oscillation a very, very small, what we call ultra micro particles, that everything is conscious. Everything is God. It's all thought. It's all God. You can't be disconnected. Well, you can think you're disconnected from the whole. You can be given that programming. But I think a lot of our work, isn't it eventually or ultimately to really convince or reconvince people certainly by our example, that everything is unified, that there, that this, th that separation, duality, okay, maybe we're here, we need to experience these polarities in order to ascend from it, in order to get past it, you and know? Can you explain, so this dimensional, this ascending to higher dimensions and this dimensional ascension, how is that connected, or is it, to Mary Magdalene and the idea of star seeds? Because I want to go back. That was okay. a really important point. Okay, here we go. So the human race was, was created by design. We timed it about 560 million years ago in the past. But interestingly enough, Debbie, this is the paradox of time. What happens in the higher dimensions actually happens in the future, this is the paradox. So what happened 560 million years ago, it was seen by Pleiadian Syrian councils that there was a lot of corruption within our time matrix. Corruption, why? Because of genetic hybridization. There were races that involved themselves in hybridization with other races without regard of their sovereignty. There was a lot of inbreeding. You see what inbreeding does on this planet after a few generations. Blah, 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 blah. Imagine <laughs> millions of years of inbreeding and improper hybridization. A lot of these races lost segments of their DNA. They cannot become fully Christed. They're trapped in time. We don't view them as evil. Even the Antichristos, well, a lot of the stuff that I talk about, and maybe in future conversations, we will talk about the origin of the Christos and the Antichristos paradigms and those races that are exemplars of it. But the fact is that the original human was created to be a healer, actually to be custodians and guardians of the stargates on this planet. We are in a cycle now, a lot of people call the ascension cycle, the shift of the ages, where interdimensional stargates are, be, are in alignment. And because of this alignment, all stars and planets have stargates at their cores, but there's a very special alignment that happens about every 26,000 years or so, where interdimensional stargates line up. We call it a stellar bridge or a stellar activation cycle and higher frequency cycles through these sets of black and white holes. We know about going into the black hole, but do people know that you just don't go into the black hole, you go out the white hole. You go into the magnetic black hole, out the electrical white hole. Stargates are sets of black and white holes. And this frequency, higher and higher dimensional frequency, 
is cycling through these stargates onto the Earth. The, the Earth has a, a set of major shockers or vortices that had to open at a certain time and stay open so the frequencies could come in to accelerate the planet, accelerate us. And they're in their closing cycle right now. It's a lot. These are big discussions, but it's important for people to know because if, if people are more familiar with the framework, with the larger context in which these uh, changes are taking place, they can much more easily navigate them. A lot of people you are like, Have you yourself ever experienced a stargate or a portal or an extraterrestrial or a spacecraft? Yes, I have. And we're going to get to that in a minute. But just more about, I want to make the connection first between the Magdalene and, and the human race. So the original, again, the original human formulated on this planet Tara, fifth dimensional version of Earth, to be custodians. Because if you're in control of the Earth stargates, mm -hmm. you have access to the universal or the interstellar stargates. I know a lot of people probably... On your uh, watch your program, see the eleven eleven on the clock, a lot. I do well, too. Yeah, that's because I believe I have no memory of past lives. Personally, I think a lot of people confuse past lives with simultaneous incarnations. There is eleven other parts of us that are part of a larger collective called an angelic or a soul matrix that choose different space time locations in our three dimensional universe. And they may have chosen times relative to our present moment in the past. They're not our past lives. They're simultaneous incarnations, but we're getting bleed through from them. So we may, I'm not saying that you know, people don't have past lives, but as far as my, me personally, I think I started this last latest incarnational journey in 11th dimensional Lyra, in the Lyra, Cradle of Lyra, Lyra. Yes. On a planet that used to be called Avion, yes. A-V-E-Y-O-N. And guess what? Because of misspelling and semantic depletion, Avion became Avalon. So 11th dimensional Lyra in the fields that we call the Christos, this is true Camelot. And so if you've come, if you've started this incarnational journey in 11th dimensional Lyra, you project yourself through these interdimensional stargates to get into incarnation here into that first cell to start the fetal integration process. You've got to come through the earth's core first, leave imprints of your DNA. Then you got to go through one of the two interplanetary stargates that relate to the 11th dimensional stargate. The two stargates on the planet here that relate to the 11th dimensional Lyran stargate is in the Vale of Pusey in England where not surprisingly, a lot of the crop circles are and a little island off the coast of Ireland called the Ireland's Eye. And then, so you start 11th dimensional Lyra, you go through the stargates, go through the earth's core, what some people call the flamer sphere of Amenti. Then you go through one of the earth's stargates, then you get into that first cell for fetal integration. This is why when that clock flips to 1111, doesn't happen at 1112, doesn't happen at 1113, happen, doesn't happen at 1110, but at 1111, it gets our attention because I think we're tuned to the 1111. So the original Earth humans called the Turinusium. And when you know a lot of Skyrish, Irish, Gaelic, when you sing those songs, Turu, Lura, 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 Lai, there's a lot of interesting knowledge encoded in that. But our true stellar, or humanity stellar heritage can be found in our DNA. And in the Earth human lineage, known originally as the Adam Kadmon or the Adumi Kudmon, there were seven root races and five cloister races were seeded on the planet. Each root race evolutionary cycle where we were seeded on the planet developed one of the first five DNA strands within our that legendary 12 strand template okay now th there are races called the, the five cloister races of which the indigos are the latest expression or iteration of we carry the seventh through the 12th dna strand the programs for that and will you so, tell people what age group uh, are the indigos so they can track okay. and relate to what you're saying indigos come with all ages um 
they started to get noticed in the 70s by psychics and clairvoyants who saw this preponderance of indigo, the color, the wavelength in their aura. Indigo is the primary wavelength of the sixth dimension. So the reason that the clairvoyants and psychics, first of all, to have that higher dimensional perception, you have to have your higher human senses activated to even see, of course, auras and whatnot. But the reason there's so much indigo in the aura is because they are born, all indigos are born with parts of the sixth strand operational. When you understand more about the DNA, you understand that each DNA strand, each double helix is programmed to process one dimension of consciousness. So if you come in, it is almost fully embodied soul. Look at the faces of these children. They're almost fully embodied souls at birth. And I think the reason they cry is because they're be when the parental car, they're born fully conscious. They can't vocalize it yet. They can try to telepath it. And sometimes you stand next to little babies and your head reels because we can't process that. We get like tinnitus, tinnitus or ringing or buzzing in the ears. We can't process those frequencies. But the reason they start crying is because they're beginning to forget. They come in with open memory. But the indigos have been coming in for hundreds of years, major waves recently, because it's very necessary for us to be on the planet. For people to really understand their soul contract, some people come here as placeholders, flame holders, this and that. And the memory is in our DNA. It, if you can clear the any residual karma and miasmic content of your DNA, the memory is there. The only thing that blocks the memory of who we are, where we come from, and what you want to know your soul's purpose, integrate, assimilate more of your soul, expand into your soul levels. And it all is relative to activating the DNA strands. Is you that sort of the healing work that you do for people? Yeah, a large part of it is doing the healing to clear all these levels of what we call the karmic miasmic imprint. Karma is a condition. Manifested is what we call miasms and they block the DNA. They block the natural activation oh, of the DNA. And so when you when our DNA is activating now, the only thing that blocks it is our own self-created karma or karma that we've inherited mm. from many generations forwards and back. Mm. But the thing is, if you're an incarnate right now, what we call the root races, and it's it's a it's it's a lot of information, some of it's a little complex because it has to do with our original makeup. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I believe that life in this time matrix began 950 billion years ago with an agreement made by really high dimensional races we call the Rishi in the fifth harmonic universe, dimensions 13 and 14 and 15. These are beings of pure light, pure radiation. They decided, however they would decide, that life would be allowed to evolve cooperatively and co-creatively within this time matrix. And that agreement we have come to know as the Emerald Covenant. The Emerald Covenant, which ultimately manifested in the creation of the human being as guardians of the Stargates and whatnot. This is interesting. The Wizard of Oz, L. Frank Baum, was a confirmed theosophist eight years before he wrote The Wizard of Oz. He was writing articles on past lives, theosophy. You look at The Wizard of Oz with a theosophical filter. I have or, also heard same that Wizard of Oz. Uh, if you look at the different colors, the yellow brick road, and and the, they use all the chakra colors throughout the story and the novel. So that's just one of many, I think, little reference points that he left there. Well, the song, Debbie. There's so many layers of interpretation. The Wizard of Oz. When you look at it through a theosophical filter, Dorothy, Dorothea, Dora, Daron Theos, gift of God. Mm. Her travels in Oz form a tetrahedron. You know, it's a it's a journey into sacred geometry. It's a journey into what makes us who we are. If you're an incarnate of one of the original seven root races, we call them earth seeds. If you're an incarnate of what we call the cloister races that carry the higher DNA codes, they're called the star seeds. And the indigos are the latest iteration or restatement of these mm -hmm. star seeds. We are here to keep the 12 strand potential in the gene pools. Like I said before, when you come into incarnation, not all of us do. If a lot of us start the incarnational process and we feel we can't birth in 
without disabilities, because our parents, especially the mothers, having cleared enough of their karmic pattern, we will go back where we came from. Now, here on the earth, it's tragic. Of course, it, it can result in abortions and miscarriages, but real, and they're tragic, of course, but realize these decisions are made on the higher levels. We're here to do a job. If we can't feel that we, if we feel we can't do the job we came here to do, we will turn around. I had an aunt, God bless her, may she rest in peace. She had seven, eight or eight miscarriages. I bet you it was the same soul trying again and again and again to get in. That's a lot. Yes. But absolutely. um, there is a incarnate. Now, there are many, many different orders. If you have the 12 strand DNA pattern, we call them the diamond sons. There are many levels of indigos too. Um, if you have a 12 to 24 strand potential, not activated at birth, but the potential to activate all those strands, we call them double diamonds. Now the emerald order, what we call the oropheme, remember there were races that are our seed races, our elder races that contributed their DNA to the original human. That's a 24 to 40 Let strand. me ask you, because I'll DNA tell you what I understand and I'd love to hear your feedback. I mean, and I'm going to make this simplistic, not very complex. And then you okay. give me your take on it. So I know 450,000 years ago, the Anunnaki came. And I mean, I think most everybody knows this story. I won't go mm -hmm. into their story, but they genetically manipulated what were humans at that time. And then we had issues, right? We had issues with childbirth, giving mm -hmm. birth to children, the longevity of life, our health and so forth. And then we had five seed races who God bless them, these benevolent races came to our assistance, which started again, us being hybrids and then um, hominids, which were the feline, the reptilians, the avians, the bird people and the high level light beings of Lyra. And that is why they're our family, why we're connected yeah. to them. It does that jive with what you know, Phil? Absolutely, positively, without a doubt. Mm. There are many, indigos are ET human hybrids. There are many, many hybridized races, like you said. And fortunately, we have all the information is here. Mm -hmm. There are, there are, have been wonderful channels or channels in the conventional sense, but there have been people that have brought this information in, downloaded it in other ways than than what's called mainstream channeling, digitally downloading it. The information is kind of like given to us as emails. Like and zip files of information. That's exactly how it works. Um, originally, when we go back to that Emerald Covenant, mm -hmm. um, it's been restated many times. The legend is that 248,000 years ago, we were given a gift during the third seeding of the human race. And the gift was 12 holographic discs that are known as the Dora Torah or the Cloister Dora Torah or the Eternal Dora Torah. These 12 holographic discs contained information that spans 950 billion years. You know, we talk about cycles of Debbie, 950 billion years. We're at a point now where I think the great mother has taken that breath 950 billion years within her, let it mix and mingle with her, and she's ready for that new out breath. And every time that we achieve ascension and atonement, again, you know, really true atonement with all that is, we bring all this experience with us to source, and even source expands. Mm -hmm. So, and the next outbreath of the Great Mother is the breathing rhythm of the cosmos, in and out. Oh, that's and, beautiful! I love that. Well, I think that's the way that's the way it works. We work the holy breath, the ruach. Ruach HaKodesh. We worship the holy breath, the Essene gospel of peace. We worship the holy breath, which is placed higher than all other things. For lo, I sound like Johnny Carson here. For lo, the eternal and sovereign, where rule the unnumbered stars, is the air we breathe in and we breathe out. But in the moment betwixt, and how did they know this? In the moment betwixt, the breathing in and the breathing out, at the top of the inhale, lies all the mysteries of the infinite garden. Breath, the, the, as a swallow plummets from the sky. May I know the, all the great mysteries. But here's where the connection with Mary Magdalene goes. There's an emerald order, 
12 strand, 24 to 48 strand DNA template, which contains, these are incarnates, they walk the earth now. I could be one, you could be one. There are ways we can teach to scan, literally scan into the DNA. Of course, it takes a lot of time. We're given these teachings, massive teachings, and, you know, teachings that used to take lifetimes or a lifetime in these Ascension Mystery Schools, the shamanic schools, right? What we're learning now used to take generations and generations, but we've got this amazing downloads information, and we're being asked to do our part to be of sincere and dedicated service. I've been through you, I've been through your website. There are very few people. What, what you're doing is so the work is so very, very important because it's really helping people discover what their true purpose is. A lot of people don't know. And the memory is there. And we teach ways to unblock the memory, to unblock the karma, to clear the karma that's already there, and teach people the true attitudes and etiquette of mastery so they don't bring any new karma in. But the Emerald Order contains the original human 12 strand DNA. That's called the Emerald Sun DNA. And the humans are that carry this DNA pattern, they're known as the primary grail lines. Wow. Those carrying the Holy Grail, wow. or grail originally means gruel, doorways or windows through which to know God. Mm -hmm. And it's the activation, the progressive activation of the DNA that we bring in more, that we expand to join our higher families of light. Angels, archangels, avatars, rishis, ascended masters mm. i don't know if it's by choice or accident that we're here but we can bring this we can bring our experience back to source with us and again even source will expand our purpose probably our overarching purpose we may have individual dreams and ways to get there but i'm sure it's to be of sincere and dedicated service when you have that holy grail pattern grew out grail pattern you can fully transmute out of matter and hold ultra terrestrial ascended master consciousness while you're in embodiment. And these are these primary grail lines. Now, there's been many, like you alluded to, there are many, many different races. There are a lot of primary races we hear about. Interestingly enough, case in point, a lot of channelers of light language. Have you noticed, Debbie, that they're beginning to sound very similar? There's a little bit of Oriental, Asian affect. Sometimes. And some Native American. Yes. Whatever, right? Absolutely, yep. Well, it makes sense to me because the first languages we're going to channel oh, are the ones closest to us genetically. Yeah, yeah. Are the ones close to us genetically. So the first languages mm -hmm. we're going to channel are fifth dimensional Pleiadian, sixth dimensional Syrian, seventh dimensional Arcturian. If we have some codes activated in our DNA, we'll be bringing in a lot of channels I know are primarily bringing in stuff from the soul matrix. Why? Because we already have three DNA strands activated. We're working on our fourth strand. So if you have those first three strands activated, you have them in all the DNA strands have all the other strands in subharmonic form. So if you have the first, second, and third DNA strands, which allow us to process our mental, emotional, and physical body consciousness, or to make us aware of that, then you have the first, second, and third subharmonic and all the higher DNA strands. I know we may be running out of time a little bit, but um, it's important because what you're channeling, when you really learn to understand and translate these languages, they all have architecture. They all have meaning. They all have their translation in music. I would like, I'm going to start working now that the COVID thing is over here in Singapore, at least temporarily. When it started, I wanted to work with high functioning autistic savants. Oh, beautiful. Yes. Because they, they can, they can do it. They can hear it. They can see it. They can feel it. They could know it. It's hard for them to communicate on this level, but they're actually ahead of their time in many, many ways. Do you know, um, Phil, just as an aside, it's very interesting you say that. Um, my grandfather was in his time famous in the world of music. He was an inventor, a prolific writer. He spoke all over the world. And um, he had a music school out on Long Island. And one day he said, 
Do you know, and it was different wording back then, so please forgive me, but I am going to use the wording back then. But he did say to somebody, he had a big place in his heart for disabled mentally people. And he said, basically, I can teach retarded people to play music. And then he was challenged. And many people at that time said, that's impossible. They're so mentally challenged. So he took that on and he took on many mentally disabled uh, students at that time. And they all became profound pianists. They understood, I'm going to call it beyond theory. They understood the matrix of music. And it was very, very powerful. He succeeded a hundred percent. So when you say this, that you want to take on the artistic, and I believe as well, that they have just come, all of them, not just the artistic, but that there's a spectrum of mm -hmm. new individuals who come here because they have many gifts, telepathic gifts, and other gifts that we don't in our density require anymore. Does that That's make sense? absolutely true. I remember when I was living, uh, I was living in uh, uh, Sonoma, mm. in uh, in California, and I would take the bus every day into San Francisco. The bus, me and a bus full of Down's children, mm. and we used to sing and everything. And I used to ask them all these cosmic questions, and their answer to me always was, "Oh, Phil, it's all love," you know. And I'm thinking, who is the one that's really disadvantaged or disabled here? There are so in much in their hearts. They know the love that knows no earthly bounds. And a lot of these people, they're just not, it's hard to work in these densities. A lot of us aren't used to these densities. A lot of us, most of us, I believe, maybe all of us, certainly the people that listen to us and that we listen to, I believe we, a lot of us, if not most of us, if not all of us come from the future. A lot of us are, for the first time in a long time, being in these densities, we're not used to it and understanding what's happening. I know I gloss over some things because these, by their nature, they're complex subjects. They have to be. Ascension is not, there's no book Ascension for dummies. It's It requires dedication. Listen, when you're in a shamanic school or one of the old Ascension or wisdom schools of old, or let's say even 2000 years ago, your life was dedicated to this. Whether you were working in the fields or transcribing, whatever. I've seen libraries with my own eyes that make the Vatican. I've tried to get into the Vatican archives many times. And for some reason, my application keeps getting rejected. But I've seen libraries in the Near East, the Far East, with my own eyes that make your the Vatican archives look like your local library. Millions of volumes. So, floors and floors, miles long of transcriptions, I believe, of these Dora Torah plates, these 12 holographic discs. And there really is, there's an echo of it in the movie, The Time Machine. Remember in 19, there was a lot of really cool movies made in 1960. There was Atlantis, The Lost Continent. 1960, where they actually show the pre-scientist hybridizing men and animals. Mm, 1960. Guys. Atlantis at Los but in the time machine with Rod Taylor, 1960, there's a scene where Yvette Mimiu, one of the Eloi, Eloi, take him into this room where there's all these like devices and books that turn into powder. She introduces them to the him to the talking rings. There are these rings that you spin and you get these audio downloads. H.G. Wells was an initiate. All of them were. Even, you know, a lot of the things. One of the main things I'm teaching these days is the master key, Charles H. Hanel. I believe you, how far can you get in personal spiritual development if you don't know how to control your thoughts? I have a whole library bookcases full of the original source material, like for the secret, but the original law of attraction books, all first editions, well, don't tell my wife, but when when we used to have fights, I would go on eBay buying sprees just to feel better. <laughs> Sometimes it took me weeks to open, the, months to open the packages. But I have a whole library of these original Law of Attraction. But look at this personal magnetism. This is what, 1923? Uh, and they're, they're not teaching classes? nowadays. Where are you teaching master key classes? Where can people get involved with that? If they just um, email me, well, the website that I'm in the process of now updating, it's most seminars, 
most.com. Most M O S T seminars.com. Because I was trying to think of a way to teach how can people, we know that you can get something out of any seminar, any lecture, any talk, but how do you maximize and optimize the information you learn? Right. You know, T. Harvecker with his financial oh, blueprint, you know, yeah. he was a student. He knew uh, the work of, uh, uh, what's his name? The plastic surgeon um, who wrote Psycho Maxwell Maltz. Mm. What's his name? Maxwell Maltz. He wrote Psycho Cybernetics. He said, oh, okay. you can't manifest anything if it's contrary to your self image. So, and that's very true. He talked about the mental blueprint and T. Harv, he made it the financial blueprint. He goes, I've talked to him about this. He can watch people coming into the seminar room. He knows already they're not going to get it because they already come in with a negative self-image. And I'm even starting to wonder about a lot of these testimonials. Now you see a guy with his new yacht, his new uh, villa. And if you come in, if you're not going to really help someone with their self-image, with a negative, if they have a negative self-image, it's very, very hard to manifest something that's contrary if you have a, a negative self-image. But these original Law of Attraction books, that's the Master Key, teach you how to control thoughts. And I think this is one of the greatest blocks to manifesting abundance, prosperity, happiness, Everything. Health, is that we can't control our thoughts. Mm -hmm. And this is why these books were so important. And Rhonda Byrne and a lot of the others, I haven't seen these law of attraction, these success coaches really talking about, it. maybe they just haven't gotten into the deeper teachings, these original books laid it out. And there's really nothing new under the sun. But again, the- um, Hey, Phil, how much did you pay on eBay for those? I paid a lot and now I'm, they're all for sale too because now they're just collecting dust. But here's Theron Q. Dumont. This was a nom de plume. This was a, um, his real name is um, William Walker Atkinson. In 1910, he wrote the book, Thought Vibration or the Law of Attraction in the Thought World. This is his first edition, Personal Magnetism. The real secrets of charisma and personal magnetism are in these books. And I think a lot of these coaches out there, they're just basically riffing off of each other. They really haven't explored the deeper teachings of the new thought movement started in the middle 1800s, went into the early decades of the 1900s. You know, every century, there's always another upsurge in interest in metaphysics and personal development. But stuff like like the salt, like uh, I'll give you a quick example. I think we have what? 15 minutes or um, no, minutes? we don't. In fact, I'm going to wrap it up right after you okay. see this. And I want to make sure to okay. also give out your email address to people who want to connect with you. So I think in to wrap it up, yes, in our quest to find out who to be successful, I mean, in any endeavor, to really be truly successful, to be of service, dedicated and sincere service to the most people, finding out who we are what our purpose is here and being able to fulfill that purpose. It requires knowledge and dedication, commitment. Some of the knowledge, I know a lot of people will listen to me and go, whoa, it's way over my, no, it isn't. It really isn't. Certainly when I have a whole day or a weekend or a retreat, I'll also I get excited because I'm just so, I, I don't know what it's going to be a year now, two, three years from now, but right now, where, where I need to be is teaching this. And by its nature, some of it is dense, it's complicated, but thank God we have these teachings. Yeah. Thank God we have these teachings to guide us and to steer us. And we realize that we're all, maybe because I know some stuff that you don't know, you know stuff that I don't listen with. Every, I may know the art of ascension, but when the toilet gets st stuffed, <laughs> I call the plumber, you know? Oh, That's it. We all, we all have our areas of specialization. And like you said, and these gifts, talents, and blessings, this is important on a practical level. People are getting it now. There's dimensional bleed through, incarnational bleed through. I've known people that have never, like you talked about, they've never played piano before. Now they're sitting down and playing like a master or they're painting like a master because this, this dimensional bleed through, incarnational bleed through is coming in. All those gifts, talents, and blessings from all our other selves or incarnations are coming in now. 
voices. We're getting starting to get perception of the higher dimensional fields. You'll know you're on the ascension path when your dreams are clearer. Remember, when we dream, our consciousness detaches from its three-dimensional focus. It's going to some of the lower mid-astral bands. It's going into the future. And what we learn in those visits with ourselves in the future, the secret is to bring it back. Yeah, to absolutely. It back. Absolutely. So I've we had this back, experience talking about, and I know how profound this is. And then I've gone out of that. I've been in that for months where it's clear these are multidimensional lifetimes I'm experiencing, or somebody may have said something to me before I fell asleep and I was given the gift of seeing the entire matrix of the situation, uh, what I was doing in it, how to change. I mean, and I remember laughing at the dream, you know, just so funny mm -hmm. when you understand all of these very basic things that get so intertwined. I so mean, let isn't me a big share. Part of, you do shamanic dream work. Isn't a big yeah. part of dream work being lucid in your dreams or, and or being navigating the dream world and Absolutely. being conscious and bringing that back? Is that a big Which is it? which sometimes, right? Uh, which right? is which, which is more real. So folks, I'm sure you, you are interested. You want to check him out and his... Email is philgruber153 at hotmail.com. It's phil, G-R-U-B-E-R, 153 at hotmail.com. Glastonbury, what are you speaking about during your time, my notable presenter? I'm going to, well, my notable co-presenter, I'm going to talk about, since we're in Glastonbury, and I think Glastonbury is a reflection of the Christos of 11th dimensional Lyra, Camelot, Camelot. And by the way, it wasn't Guinevere, it was her sister. Whoops. Anyway, um, so. We're going to have I'm, so I'm going to talk about the Christos. I'm going to talk about what the Christos is, its relationship to Lyra, Um Awesome. Talk about the the Christ. Talk about Mary Magdalene a lot, a little more in depth about them, John the Baptist, what they came here to do. A lot of the those dramas, the door Torah plates, and also the origin of the Antichrist paradigm too. We don't focus on the digressive races, but they're here. They have their agendas. We have our agendas. You know, there are things happening on the planet. You don't. You. It's it's obvious now that there are are things that are maybe coming in to limit our scope, limit our ability to widen our perspective. Well, there are things that we can do and, 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 and your work and my work and all of our work is really ultimately to help free people from these mortal coils. Ascension is the evolutionary path of human consciousness and have yeah. fun along the way. Totally. It's, oh, it's yeah, it's fun. Work, it's, but, yes, it's it's know? important in all of this to not take it so seriously, to learn what we can, make it fun, and do what we came here to do, live at our mission. And a big part of our mission for all of us is in whatever way we show up for that piece of the puzzle right. is to help others. For folks who want to come to see Phil, myself, and the other amazing presenters, you got to check out who else is going to be there. Plus... Be in Glastonbury, King Arthur, Mary Magdalene. We're doing tours, everything. It's going to be a beautiful experience. Go to debbie-inger.com slash Glastonbury, D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash Glastonbury. Phil, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Dream. Um. Well, I got a little, I got a little fungus I'm dealing with now at the moment. <laughs> um, my dream is, is to still to continue to find ways to be of the greatest service to the most people to be happy. I have my stuff to listen. I, I had a walking experience. Didn't get a chance to talk about it today, but you can only talk about it so much, but even doing these broad strokes, if it stimulates, if it, piques the curiosity or if people resonate with it, you know, I, I missed a, a lot of my growing up. My walking happened at six years old. I got hit by a car head on, not a scratch, got thrown up in the air, you know, cause something came in. That was, that was, that was, that was 
intervention, real intervention. I know a lot of the angelics don't like to intervene directly. They put themselves at risk, but I have work to do. And so from 6 to 16, 17, I was like living in both worlds. But what I didn't get was a lot of emotional training in those wonder years. So I'm still I'm trying to catch up now. My wife thinks I have no emotional no emotional intelligence. I do, you know, <laughs> but I have to learn. But I, there's always been a piece of me. And I think a lot of people out there, there's been pieces that we've not been able to, or haven't been able to learn how to share with someone else. Hmm. I, and yeah, so I even totally though get I that. got huge informational downloads at six years old, that really started to unwind when I was a teenager. Um, I missed out on a lot of emotional growth, bonding, this type of thing. And this, these are things that we all have things to learn. So I know that when I teach and the people that come from my, I offer personal mentorship programs, when they, when they come to me, I know these are people who I asked for also. Yes. I'm not one of these teachers that has their niche and yep. stays closed. I am as open, even more open than ever for ways to improve myself to be the better version of myself, even to develop. And I know you specialize in develop strategies to make yourself more visible. We're all entrepreneurs. We all are. I adore are. you. I am so I grateful you, you came I on the show and to get to know you and to know we'll be hanging out in such a beautiful, mystical place oh, yeah. together. And who knows to what will happen. Just like you said, if you're on the fence, you know, there's an old expression, if not now, when, when? you know, come to Glastonbury, just come, go with your gut. That's the secret. The solar plexus is the gateway to the, to, to, to the treasury. If you have a gut feeling, everybody out there, I know the times that we didn't go with our gut because the solar plexus is a real big key to abundance, manifestation, prosperity. The solar plexus controls our emotions, not our heart. When you want to feel the fullness of emotion that you need, feeling to manifest, you've got to breathe deeply. You've got to wake up the solar plexus. And if your solar plexus is expanding and contracting right now, go to debbie-dashinger.com slash Glastonbury. Join us. It's going to be an adventure of a lifetime. I love you, Phil. And I'm going to end. Thank you so much. I'm going to end today's show with this quote from Dr. Alberto Villodo. We come to realize that the universe, mar mar wow. <laughs> We come to realize that the universe mirrors back to us perfectly our beliefs, our intentions, our sincerity. What is the product of the map of reality you carry inside you? If you want to change your experience, you need to change the map. If you enjoyed this podcast, please follow, subscribe, like, leave a five-star review. Your support helps other people to find this information and discover the show, and it means the world to me. Thank you in advance. Next week on the program, I'm speaking with Tamara Calder Richardson, a six-time near-death experiencer, evidential psychic medium, and Christ an angelic channeler. Remember this week to stay in peace, not in pieces.